Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the webinar this evening, which is being hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Catherine Parrott, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on grazing for turnout. Our presenter this evening is Mark Jones, a farm business consultant from ADAS. So the plan of action for this evening is Mark will take you through a presentation, and then there'll be some time for questions at the end. You'll all be muted throughout the webinar, but if anybody would like to ask a question or at any time, if you think of anything throughout the presentation, then just type it into the box on the right hand side of your screen. And when Mark's finished presenting, I can ask him those questions. And um, we've got over 140 people registered for the webinar this evening. So I'd just like to thank Elena, who's working behind the scenes to keep everything running as smoothly as possible. But please do bear with us should we encounter any technical difficulties. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Mark. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, so just as Catherine mentioned, uh, I'm Mark Jones, and uh, I work as a farm business consultant for ADAS. I've been working for ADAS now for 12 to 13 years, uh, very much focused on beef and sheep farms. Um, again, based in Mid Wales, uh, so deal with a lot of Welsh farmers, but um, come over the border quite a bit as well nowadays. Um, generally, uh, very much grass and forage based um, advice, uh, but I've got a good rounding in farm business management as well. Uh, but just to give you a bit of background with a couple of projects uh, we also do with AHDB, we're currently running a beef from grass uh, project um, where we've got uh, four demonstration farms, which are Andrew Crow, Tim Phipps, Matt House, and Bob and Liz Priest. And basically, uh, we're working with suckler cows and we're aiming to try and increase uh, their grassland management to increase stocking rate and, and profitability on those holdings so if you'd like to to have a look on ahdb you'll be able to find a little bit more information about that uh, we've also got a, an outdoor dairy beef uh, project running with ahdb uh, we're running that jointly with harper adams and simon marsh where again we're, we're focusing on, on grass and, and forage uh, we've got 35 Frisian steers and 35 Hereford steers, where we're aiming to take them from calf rearing uh, through to finish on grass and fodder beet, and then again finish uh, on grass again. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more information for you over the next few months uh, from that. Uh, but coming back to um, tonight, uh, we're very much looking at grazing for turnout. Um, We've had a, a pretty terrible winter so far uh, with all the rainfall. But I suppose at least we've now dried up and uh, hopefully after this week's past, we might see a little bit of warmth and uh, actually see some grass growing at last. So in terms of grazing for turnout, um, I suppose looking at uh, priorities, we're looking at key considerations at turnout. So again, weather and grass growth have got to be uh, top of that list at the moment. It's very important to get the, the turnout date right. Uh, if we get it wrong, we're having to go out and feed more concentrates and more silage, which is very costly to us. But at the same time, we don't want to be keeping the stock inside because it costs around £1.50 a day to keep a, a suckler cow. Well, outside, it's going to be about half that amount. Um, in terms of nutrition and mineral supply, uh, I suppose we've got to focus on can grass in the spring uh, give everything that the ewe or a, sh uh, or a cow needs. And again, what do we need to do to balance uh, the mineral supply uh, during that time of the year? We've also got fertilizer use, which is very important. Again, uh, there's no point looking at any of this if we haven't got a lime P and K uh, in order. Again, grass and ryegrass and clover are simply not gonna grow as well uh, if we haven't got our soil indices correct. And then finally, uh, one of the most important bits is looking at monitoring sward height and grass utilisation. We can't manage our grassland properly. Uh, it's going to deteriorate throughout the year. and We may as well be feeding hay uh, rather than feeding good quality grass. So just to, to refocus really on our, our key considerations at turnout, really what is our, our main aim? Well, quite simply, it's to try and utilise more grass. And that really is focusing on earlier spring turnout and uh, later use in the autumn. And we're really doing this just to try and reduce our cost reduction as a, a beef and sheep industry. So really, when we're focusing on our costs, we're looking at grass and forage crops at around six pence per kilo of dry matter eaten. 
And again, that is only if you're managing it well. Um, we're then looking at silage and concentrates. Silage is going to cost you around 12 to 15 pence per kilo of dry matter eaten. And then in terms of concentrates, we're looking at 20 to 25 pence per kilo of dry matter eaten. So, you know, it's a doubling of cost each time you step from silage and then onto concentrates. And then what we've got to be also focusing on is all of the fixed costs associated with feeding those concentrates and silage. You know, we've got telehandlers, Merlots, uh, we've got TMRs, and straw choppers. Uh, we've also got large buildings, which again, cost a huge amount of money to put up. So if we can get our stock out and utilize grass a little bit earlier, we can really try and reduce our, our cost reduction. The other important point is to try and create quality regrowth. Again, the focus for that first grazing in the spring is to nail the grass as hard as we can to get some nice fresh regrowth um, for the next cycle, the next rotation. And really what our focus is, is to try and keep that quality going into May and June, where grass quality may deteriorate if we haven't grazed it properly in the first place. But what we're trying to focus on is trying to get our grass quality up at 12 to 12 and a half ME, which is possible throughout the season. But it's all about good quality management. We're then looking to prioritize stock going out in the spring. So again, we don't really want dry cows going out and, and utilizing that good quality feed. Really, we're looking to focus on lactating ewes. Again, uh, takes two to three weeks for, for sheep to hit peak lactation. And it's at that point we want them eating the highest quality grass possible to allow that peak lactation to carry on for a week or two more. And that's going to really boost um, growth rates in lambs. I think in terms of finishing cattle, there's no reason why cattle can't do over a kilo a day finishing on good quality spring grass. But it's very important to manage it and uh, get those cattle out nice and early. So grass quantity, what are we looking for at turnouts? Well, I suppose for sheep, we need a minimum of uh, three to four centimetres. And again, for cattle, around six centimetres. And really, it's all to do with how much is there and how hard we want to push the stock. If we've got three to four centimetres for sheep, uh, we're probably still needing to, to supplement those sheep a little bit at the start. But really, once we get into four to five centimetres grass, there's no reason why we should be feeding concentrates at all. And again, it's the same principles uh, with the cattle. Again, they can go out at six centimetres and uh, go around the farm. But really, once we're getting into April, we're wanting those covers to get larger and we're wanting their intakes to get higher. So again, growth rates can be pushed to above that kilo a day mark. And again, so the lambing and calving date is, is very important. Um, if we're calving, for example, in, at around Christmas time, uh, you've got a stock and calves um, sat inside. But also, if you're calving later in April, you've, you're going to try and calve those cattle inside. You've really added two months of housing. Well, if you're calving in the middle of February, you could be turning those cattle out as they calve. And it's exactly the same principle for lambing. Where do we need to be to, to maximize, uh, I suppose, our grass intakes from those sheep? If we're lambing uh, in early January and early February, we're having to feed a lot of concentrates. However, if we're aiming to lamb in early April, that grass is growing with us and we can really reduce our, our cost of reduction there. But I suppose it's really about trying to manage the grass so we can rest it during that winter period to allow those stock to come out in late February, early March, and really utilize it properly. But again, supplementation is a, a key part to that. Uh, we may need to, to add a bit of silage uh, to the situation, like this time of the year. At the moment, we've got very little grass growth at all, um, although conditions have allowed us to get uh, cattle and, and sheep out onto the fields. But we may need to add a little bit of forage or a supplement just to allow that grass uh, to come back later on in, say, a month's time. Um, other 
conditions. Well, we're going to be looking at ground conditions, for instance. Uh, like I mentioned before, we've had a very wet uh, start to the spring, and now we've had uh, this nice cold weather, which has dried it up brilliantly. But the key thing is that we have to be flexible with spring grazing. Um, so that quite often means on off grazing, um, and we need to have the ability to, to bring stock out of buildings and put them back in, into them if we need to. But again, the use of infrastructure like tracks, um, it's going to allow us to get to, to those fields at time of the year when it's quite wet, and we can put uh, stock on for three or four hours and bring them back off and into the sheds. And you know, they would have had their intakes, which would have been about three quarters of the amount they require for the day during that period. So it's reducing our forage costs in terms of silage, but also reducing the need for concentrates as well. Ground temperature, again, that's a key one. So I suppose it's linked to grass growth and of course, uh, date we're going out at. Date doesn't really matter. I suppose it's all about grass growth and that, that temperature. Uh, soil temperatures are at zero or below at the moment. So we're literally not getting any growth whatsoever. Um, so farmers have to be a little bit more careful if they've started their rotation currently. Uh, there's no grass growth coming back after the cattle or sheep have grazed. Um, so they're going to have to buffer feed or add a little bit of silage or supplement in there to try and extend the grazing. Uh, just so that they've got enough grass available when they aim to get into their second rotation in early April. But in terms of getting the turnout date right, everything we need to focus on comes back to our management back in the autumn or even the previous summer. So really what we're aiming to do is to build up covers of grassland in September. So basically we've got the most grass possible on the farm on that date. This then enables us to budget and create a wedge going into the, into the autumn. And then it allows us to graze it um, steadily into October and early November, and then allow us to shut the fields off to save them for the spring. So I suppose what we're aiming to do for cattle, it quite simply is start our, our last rotation, if we're rotational grazing in early October, and then basically shut the fields as we move around the farm. So we could have a 30 or 40 day rotation. Uh, if we've started from the 1st of October, we're likely to finish around the middle of November. But more importantly, we would have rested fields from the 1st of October, and those fields would be the first fields that we would aim to graze into February. So we're talking middle of February turnout, they go into those first fields that uh, we'd rested in October. Exactly the same principles with sheep, but again, we don't need the covers in front of, front of them going forward in the spring. So we're only looking for three to four centimetres uh, for those fields to recover. So if those fields could be rested in late December, we, and then we rest them January and February, we'll have four to five centimetres ready in March for those sheep to go back out to the, to the lambing fields. But again, we've got to really focus on what we're doing with our sheep. Again, if we've got a late lambing system where we're, we're lambing in April, we would aim to shut those lambing fields off in um, late December. So we would graze them mid to early December. Uh, we would have grazed all the outlying fields in November. And then that allows us in early March to come back to those outlying fields to graze them in early March and then set stock on our lambing fields in late, late March, ready for April lambing. Uh, the chart below, this has basically been taken from Pasture Base Ireland, and it shows the effect of autumn closing dates on spring grass accumulation. So basically, as you can see on the chart from the 2nd of October, uh, this is carried through around 1100 kilos of dry matter extra through to the following spring. What we've got to remember though with the Irish data is that the residual of 1500 kilos starts at zero. So effectively, we're starting instead of zero at 1500. So inevitably, they've got covers of 2006, 2700 in the spring for that 2nd of October date. 
But as we're moving through the year, you can see by the time we get to the 23rd of November, covers have reduced down to 700 kilos, roughly, uh, to be carried through to the spring. So it all means if you're not shutting, if you're shutting off a little bit later, you won't have that grass available in the spring. And then just to go into it in a little bit more detail, uh, especially in terms of cattle, uh, a lot of dairy farmers are now using a spring grazing planner. And again, the Irish have now used this in their suckler herds. And this is a great tool that can now be utilised over in the UK as well. So inevitably, what we're aiming to do is from middle of Feb to early April is to create a 50 day rotation. And that's quite simply splitting all the fields on the farm to last 50 days. And what we would aim to do is take a proportion of our stock just to fit that amount required each day. So, for example, a 50 day rotation will be 2% of your grazing platform every day. So if it means 50 cows out of 100, you would start the rotation with just those, those 50 as they went through. The key importance to this system is that uh, it's on off grazing. Um, you can either utilize sheds or tracks or even fields which are due to be plowed the following spring. Again, as a, a run back to feed silage or, or other concentrates. The other key aspect is that we're aiming to really hit the residuals and nail them down to about three to four centimeters. So as I mentioned before, if you're carrying covers of grass through to the spring, which are at two and a half to two six, it's very important that those covers are taken off to allow the fresh spring regrowth. And this is why we're trying to focus on increased digestibility then going into May and June. And you'll find that many farmers on this system have still got energy levels or ME levels at 12 to 12 and a half in late June, July time. Now the chart again just describes why it's so important to allow the spring grass growth there and to actually graze it. So as you can see, again from pasture base Ireland, basically the higher your spring dry matter production, the higher your annual grazing dry matter production is for the year. And that again is linked to profitability exactly the same. So going back to nutrition and mineral supply, um, going back to spring grass, well, the important question, is it a complete diet? And at 12 and a half ME and 20% protein, as long as weather conditions allow, you haven't got a foot of snow, or it's so wet that the sheep or cattle can't get the dry matter intakes, there's no reason why sheep with lambs at foot or growing cattle can't survive on grass alone. Um, again, previous experiments um, we've done with AHDB have shown that for a movement from forage crops or Swedes in uh, February to good grass growth in the middle of March, has shown that energy and protein requirements um, from four weeks and two weeks prior to lambing have all been adequate, with a slightly high protein um, just due to the, the higher protein of the grass. But again, there's no reason if you've got good grass levels at four to five centimetres that there's any need for any supplementation. So looking at transition to grass uh, from housing or, or from outwintering, Again, it's a very important point. If you've just ticked those cattle over the winter on just silage alone and being aiming for half a kilo or 0.6 of a kilo, and exactly the same if you've been out wintering them and that is what growth targets are, you'll find that those cattle will transition to grass very well. Um, they'll go straight out and have compensatory growth and will be aiming for growth rates of around a kilo or more a day. However, if you've housed them and you've fed them uh, too much, um, you've kept growth rates sort of at a kilo or more, you're then going to have the issue that you're going to have to supplement outside for, for probably three weeks to a month. Um, otherwise, these cattle are going to sink uh, quite a lot as they go out. 
The other option uh, would be to feed silage alone for about a month pre-turnout, and then you won't have that, that knock-on effect and the cattle will go out and, and go forward. And um, coming back to mineral supply, uh, I suppose the key ones are copper, selenium, cobalt, and iodine. Again, with copper, you've got to be slightly careful with sheep. Uh, breeds like Texel and Fleen don't need copper, while other breeds do. However, the majority of, of cattle would do. Uh, selenium, cobalt, and iodine, again, are very important in terms of health and growth rates. But iodine, particularly if you're lambing outside and, and with uh, calves as well, if you're wanting them that get up and go. Um, and if you've got a low iodine, um, they're going to struggle to do that. But really, you need to blood test uh, the sheep um, and also take soil samples of the ground to really give you a full picture of where you are. Uh, mineral buckets and boluses are expensive. Uh, boluses are, say, a pound per ewe or £4.50 per cow. Again, that's a, that's a lot of money wasted if you haven't gone out and, and analysed to see if you need it in the first place. And again, if you are supplementing with concentrates, um, again, you're, you're adding um, minerals to the system anyway. So in terms of monitoring sward height and grass utilisation, uh, this is some of the more important side. Um, if your management is, is poor, uh, your grass, grass is going to get out of control, you're going to lose quality, and that's going to have the knock-on effect of reduced growth rates from your lambs, um, and from your cattle as well. But you'll also find that your stocking rates will reduce also. Uh, so if we're set stocking, uh, we're aiming for around four centimetres. Um, and again, that's perfect probably for the first um, four to five weeks. Um, again, if you're going to carry on set stocking throughout the season, that's your target really to keep it at that height. And um, again, you won't have such a high stocking rate that you maintain that quali quality throughout. And again, with cattle, we're looking at five to six centimetres initially. I'm probably aiming to, to put it a little bit higher as we, as we come out of the spring period. Um, in terms of rotational grazing, again, you're not going to aim to rotational graze probably until about a month after lambing, um, as the lambs will be uh, a little bit too small and you'd expect a few mix-ups. But again, we're aiming to, to turn in at eight to ten centimetres, or sort of a maximum of two and a half thousand kilos of dry matter. Any more than that, and the sheep can't um, graze it down hard enough and utilise it fully. Um, again, with the cattle, slightly higher covers there at ten to fourteen centimetres. Again, we're we're probably aiming for two and a half thousand to three thousand kilos a hectare, and really, it's important to be hitting the um, these cover targets just to be able to graze down to that 1500 kilo residual or that three to four centimeters and that's where we aim to maintain our grass quality throughout the season. Like I said any higher than two and a half thousand kilos and the sheep cannot manage, manage it to, well enough. Uh, in terms of utilization uh, we've got set stocking uh, where it's targeted at around 50 percent Initially, in the early spring, you're probably going to be up near paddock grazing at around 80%. But as the grass grows and you have a little bit of uh, dead matter in the leaf, it's going to reduce back down to like that 50%. Rotational grazing, where we're aiming to move the stock, I suppose, every five or six days, we're looking at around 65% utilisation. And then finally, with paddock grazing, where, where we're aiming to, I suppose, increase numbers of stock or, or move sheep and cattle every couple of days, we're then progressing to sort of 80% utilisation. But the important point is um, utilisation is, is very key with rotational grazing and, and how we use that. Basically, the higher the utilisation, the higher the kilograms of meat produced per hectare. But unfortunately, uh, it does have a knock-on effect that will lower the actual daily live weight gain of the individual animal. So we've very much got to try and focus on balancing it between maximising uh, grass growth and utilisation, while also trying to push each individual animal to their, to their maximum. So a lot of farmers will only, when they're rotational grazing, move um, 
the stock every four days. So you can imagine if you've got uh, ewes with twin lambs, for the first two days, um, they're eating all of the good, good quality grass and clover. But by the time they get to day three and four, uh, their intakes are reduced and they're eating sort of nine ME grass. Um, so there's two ways around it. Um, you can either have two lots of stock, you could go in with your ewes with twins, um, and then they'd be in there for two days out of the four days, and then you'd aim to put the singles in there afterwards to, to mop up. As the single ewes would have uh, more, more milk um, for, their, for their lambs, the growth rate won't drop off quite as badly as it would for the twin lambs. In terms of cattle, exactly the same principle. Um, are we looking for the suckler cows to follow the finishing cattle, or do we have any dry stock um, which we don't need to push? Certain times of the year, it could be actually using dry ewes um, during the summer period when we've got the finished cattle. But again, um, it's, it's a very important point. Some people will go gung-ho uh, with their rotational grazing and utilisation, and then they've still got lambs left after Christmas, which is not what we're aiming to do. Uh, finally, uh, we're looking at fertiliser use. So I suppose our key nutrients are, are going to be lime, phosphate, potash and nitrogen. Um, very important that um, for your grass-based systems that the whole farm is soil sampled. And the most important point is getting that lime correct. If we haven't got the lime correct and pH is down at five and a half, you're basically chucking away 50% of any nutrients you're putting down straight away. So get that line right, that's the most important point. And then we're really looking to try and focus on, on some of the other elements. So looking at the, the table below, this gives us um, recommendations um, based on indexes for grazed grass. And as you can see along the top, we've got index 0, 1, 2 and 3 with zero having very little phosphate or potash in the soil, and index three having um, too much. Really, we're aiming to target indexes two for phosphate and two minus for potash, and this is our maintenance level. If we're below that at index one or zero, we're having to put a lot more phosphate and potash down to, to really um, get our yield back up to where it should be. But as you can see from the table, if we're targeting index two, um, we're aiming to put down around 20 kilos per hectare of phosphate. Now in the spring, we do get a small response uh, from phosphate going down there. So I'd always suggest to put that, that down um, in the spring. And especially if we've got our indexes down at zero and one, we're really looking to target that phosphate in the spring and we can see a 30% uplift then in, in grass grown. Um, just because it's able to utilise everything a little bit better. But in terms of nitrogen, um, we could be aiming for around 30 kilos a hectare of, of nitrogen in early March. Um, if you're keen and you've got some south facing banks, which are free draining and weather conditions are nice and warm. And like I mentioned before, if grass, the grass is not even start growing at uh, five degrees centigrade. So we're looking for around five days at that temperature. We can then go out and put nitrogen down on, on those fields and some of the back facing fields we can do a little bit later in the season but again we're aiming for 30 kilos per hectare of nitrogen um urea is probably your cheapest type of nitrogen fertilizer at that point of the year if it's wet and cold and miserable um urea is going to be retained a little bit longer in the soil and it takes probably two to three weeks to, to get going while your nitrate um, could be lost if you have some wet conditions during that period. So really we're looking to target um, 30 kilos and again um, at index two we're just looking for that 20 kilos a hectare of phosphate in the spring. The other important side of it is uh, looking at um, hypomagnesia and um, really if we do have to put potash down we're really trying to avoid putting it down in the spring especially if you know you've got an issue. So if you for instance if you're at index zero We'd like to be putting potash down, um, ideally in the summer months, where we won't have a, a bad, bad response from the stock. Okay, um, that's everything now. If you, you'd like to uh, come in with any questions, I'll hand back to Catherine. Thank you.
Brilliant, thank you, Mark. Um, whilst I'm just waiting for some questions to come in, I'd just like to remind you all that the presentation's been recorded and will be available on the AHDB YouTube channels, along with other previous webinars from AHDB Beef and Lamb, should you want to revisit it. Um, we also have various documents such as manuals on improving pasture and on planning grazing strategies, which are all available online as well um, and quite relevant to the content of this evening's webinar. So you can email brp at ahdb.org.uk if you'd like to receive a hard copy as well. Um, okay, first question, Mark, is um, should grazing the same pasture at the same time of year be avoided two years in a row? Um, no, it shouldn't matter matter at all. As long as you've um, basically built up the appropriate covers from the, the previous autumn and you've got um, you've got enough grass there, um, you'd go out and graze it um, at the same time. But again, in the spring, you'd just be basically trying to target um, the areas with your highest covers first. So fields would probably vary from year to year. Okay. Um, in an autumn such as we have just experienced, with good growth well into December and then very cold, frosty weather, if we carry too much cover from October, are we in danger of getting winter kill? especially with new lay? Uh, the, the grass, although it might look a little bit yellow, um, will still be there and it's actually full of sugars um, at that point. So um, if you go in and graze it very hard then in the spring, again, you'll just get fresh regrowth and it shouldn't be an issue. Um, again, it's the same principle uh, this time of the year um, with this season. Uh, go in, graze it hard, and you'll get that regrowth um, nice and lush in you know, three, four weeks' time if it does warmer. Okay, thank you. Um, with rotational grazing, do I understand correctly that the utilisation is better but the daily live weight gain will be lower than a paddock system? Yes, um, and again, it all depends on how quickly you move them. Um, basically, the longer they're in one paddock, I mean, or field, um, after two or three days in there, they're left with a lot of the rubbish grass and, and stalkier grass and all the leaf is gone. So um, you're then reducing the live weight gain of the individual animal. And again, with, with the rotational grazing and with how the grass plant grows, especially in, in May and June when grass is growing at its quickest, you don't want to be re-grazing grass within two to three days. Okay, and then another question on um, paddock grazing. What would be the recommended sward heights in a paddock grazing system as opposed to rotational grazing? Uh, they'd be exactly the same. There wouldn't be any difference. Um, all it would mean is that you'd be you'd have slightly more stock on a smaller area for the paddock grazing, and then they'd be in there for say two days rather than half the stock being in there for four days. Okay. Um, and then another question on that is, what would you recommend for sheep in terms of paddock size and mob size? Um, again, it te tends to be on what your system and your handling pens can hold, because I suppose sheep uh, wouldn't come in until you're either doing that first worming or you're looking to pick, pick lambs out of them. So essentially there's no reason why you couldn't have a thousand in one group or or 50 in, in one group really just all depends on your facilities and your field sizes and, and how you can manage it okay thank you um would we be better to move sheep every two days to get to the 12 ma um ideally yes uh that would be your, your perfect target um it's, it's trying to find a balance between workload and moving stock um, and achieving the right growth rates and, and quality grass. So again, it, it depends on the balance you want. Um, I suppose technically dairy farmers would be moving them every 12 hours, you know, when they're milking. So that is taking it to another extreme. But again, you know, they're moving those stock at that time. Um, it's diff different for, for sheep producers. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your views on regular harrowing of the fields after they have been grazed and aeration of fields? Um, with harrowing, 
Um, I don't think you need to need to do it really, unless unless there's an issue in terms of you don't like uh, getting bumped off your seat on a tractor. Um, if you've had a little <laughs> bit of poaching. Um, in terms of money-wise or or the sword, um, there's not really a benefit unless it's an old sword and it's full of moss and you want to rip that out, or you're looking to overseed and um, rip it up a little bit. Um, in terms of aerating, it's very much um, digging a hole and having a look to see if it if uh, the ground requires it. Um, if the roots are, are down um, and there's no issue and you've got plenty of earthworms, there's no need to bother. So again every field's going to be treated individually. Okay, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on grazing cattle and sheep together? Does this increase grass utilisation as they graze the sward at different lengths? Um, I don't think um, it, it makes a, a huge difference. Um, Probably it just makes it a little bit trickier to fence because you'd have uh, three strands of wire. You need three strands of wire across the farm if you were electric fencing compared to one for cattle. Uh, I suppose I would I would prefer to probably graze cattle on one half of the farm at the start of the season and then swap them with sheep the other the other side of the season. Um, just for a practical reason, it's just made a little bit easier. But in terms of the sward, I don't think it makes a difference as long as those sheep covers aren't getting too big and they're able to graze graze down hard. Okay. Um, in terms of groups of cattle following each other around a rotation, such as sucklers after finishes, would you recommend any time in between the groups for the pasture to recover? So almost running two separate but overlapping rotations. Um, yeah, it's quite a quite a tricky tricky situation really um i suppose really you'd be wanting those supply cows to follow straight in after them and ideally you would you'd prefer to uh have fields or group sizes big enough uh that the finishing cattle will come out of the field and then the supply cows would go in um if you've only got uh i suppose if you've got big fields and smaller groups uh you could have issues with with mixing um which could be a practical problem but it does work very well on some farms if the fields are a little bit smaller and the group sizes are are big okay thank you um one of the earlier slides showed that utilization was greatest from paddock grazing over rotational or set stock but you make the point that daily gains are reduced is there any data available on what system gives the greatest tons of beef per year per hectare rather than grass growth or utilisation? Um, sorry, uh, could you say that one again? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the earlier slides showed that utilisation was greatest from paddock grazing over rotational or set stock grazing, but you made the point that daily gains are reduced. Is there any data available on what system gives the greatest tons of beef per year per hectare rather than grass growth or utilisation? Yeah, well, if you're looking for the largest um, amount of beef produced per hectare, it's still going to be the system which produces the most grass. So if you can grow and utilise 12 tonnes, um, you're going to have more beef than you would from 10 tonnes. But it's the individual animal which might grow slightly slower on a more intensive system, if that makes sense. OK, thank you. Um, we're starting a paddock grazing system this year. At present, all paddocks are within 400 kilos of dry matter of each other. Um, that's ranging from 1450 to 1850. Cows are turned out as they calf. How do I create and manage a 50 day rotation with, with ever increasing and changing stock numbers? Uh, it's about um, trying to get your groups into tens and twenties. Um, really, you're aiming to to graze, graze a proportion of the farm, 30% uh, by early January, and then the remaining 60% um, during March. So you can turn out more and more cows as you're going. Uh, but I suppose the important side is that you can still maintain so many cows inside until that grass growth has caught up with yourself. But really what we're trying to do is try and hold out the stock 
on a proportional ground for those 50 days and if that means housing a proportion so then when it comes to the first week in, in April we can make sure everything's out and everything's flying around if that makes sense. Great thank you. Um, do finishing lambs prefer a different length sward to breeding ewes? Um, it's not really going to make a, a huge amount of difference. Uh, probably the, the most important one is making sure they're on your, your better pastures with high levels of, of clover in. Um, that's probably the mo most important aspect. Again, with, with lambs, you're probably wanting them to utilise 40, 50% of the sward and then move them on to the next, next field and then get something to, to mop up after them. So then your growth rates are at 300 grams rather than 200 grams a day. That's probably the more important aspect. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, do you have any advice on using plate meters? Um, in terms of the type or just uh, how to use them? Or? Um, I'm afraid that's all I've got. I'm guessing it's because it's on using. I'm guessing it is um, on how to use them. Yeah, uh, well, I suppose the the to to start with, um, if you're starting from the basics, the plate meter is a good tool just to get your eye in. Um, there's no need, probably initially, to to use the plate meter weekly. I would I would suggest um, you to use it just to to find the covers and residuals you're aiming for, and then moving stock on on that basis. And then once you've done a done um, a few months of that or a season and you've got used to it i would then try and start using computer programs you've got farmax or agrinet uh, and then based on those principles you could go out weekly with your plate meter but it all again depends um how intensive you want the grass management to be going forward because uh, again it is quite time consuming it's probably going to take you a morning or a full day depending on the, on the size of your farm so I'd suggest start off uh, nice and easy so you've got an idea of just use your plate meter to give you an idea of covers and then you can move stock stock around as you see fit and then slowly increase it over a season or two. Okay, thank you. Um, last year we found larger and larger areas rejected. Um, we were recommended some pre-cutting before grazing. Would it be okay to spread a light coat of slurry on the paddock after grazing? Um, yeah, that shouldn't be shouldn't be an issue after grazing. Um, again, um, if you're pre if you're uh, pre mowing and then uh, looking for the cattle to to graze, looking to mop, you know, they they'll mop it all up compared to if it was standing there, which which does sound odd. I think it's just like a silage silage aftermath afterwards so uh, as long as you've had a little bit of rain um, there's no reason why why the cattle re will reject it in 20-25 days time. Okay thanks. Um, what is the total amount of nitrogen that you would recommend and in how many applications? Um, again it all depends on your farming system on, on how much clover you've got. Um, you could probably be going essentially monthly uh, with 30 to 40 kilos of nitrogen through to, to August, um, if you're being very intensive. Um, again, it's how do you manage that peak growth in May and June? Um, and again, do you try out in the summer as well, where you, you may have to knock nitrogen um, out completely? So, um, yeah, you could go around monthly at your most, most intensive. Great, thank you. Um, I've just got another point on that um, harrowing question. Somebody's asking um, what they wanted to know was, would it help to break down the cattle work quicker after it's been grazed? Yeah, if, you're, if your systems, um, if you're rotational grazing and you're, you're moving regularly, the muck should um, uh, break down um, where it is. Um, what you'll find that if you're if you're looking to harrow for that kind of reason, you just smear the smear the muck out over a bigger area and make more of it sour. Um, the only thing I would say is that when you might have got to the third or fourth or fifth rotation, there are patches where the cattle tend to reject, 
and uh, then it might be worthwhile um, pre-mowing. So you're going with, uh, uh, not with a topper, but an actual, say, a mower or more conditioner, and um, you just put an electric fence out and give the cattle a proportion of, of that, and it's surprising that they'll mop all that up if you can hold them there and they, once they get used to it. Um, and then you have that nice lush grass coming back through with no, no seed heads again. Okay, um, what's most effective, shutting up earlier in winter and turning out earlier the following spring, or keeping them out as long as possible in the autumn and winter and then turning out a bit later? Or is it more a case of reaching a certain sward height before bringing them inside or turning them out? Um, it would tend to be based on um, your, your farming system. So I've got farms which, which do it both ways. Um, some of the later calving guys, uh, they don't need spring grass, so I try and make them graze into late November, early December, and keep the cows out then because they're, they're calving inside um, in sort of March, April time, so it's a pointless exercise. Um, and it works the other way around as well, so if you're calving you know, from mid-Feb, it's, it's a perfect time to, to utilise that, that spring grass. So again, you can design the system to around your stock and, and your livestock system. Okay, um, to what extent would you recommend topping after rotational grazers? Yeah, like, like I said, um, I wouldn't use a topper. Um, a topper tends to, um, it doesn't cut quite low enough and it, um, it doesn't cut the grass properly. So if you were going to, to cut, I'd use uh, a mower and then again, it would get to a point in the season uh, where you would judge that the cattle are rejecting too big an area. And um, quite often, especially on steeper grounds, you'll find that they're always sitting in one place and uh, that's where they excrete um, and, you know, they won't graze that area. So then by uh, pre-mowing and forcing them to, to graze it down, but you have to keep them a little bit tighter by our electric fences. Um, that works very well. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, and what is the best treatment for frothy bloat? Um, some use uh, have used vegetable oil in um, in uh, water tanks, um, and then other than that, it's it's being um, being very careful to adjusting. Uh, cattle and stock to uh, lays high in, high in clover um, and again if they're on clover all the time it doesn't seem to be the issue it tends to be the, the issue of in going from very little to, to quite a lot quite quickly so sometimes you'll have fields with lots of clover and some with very little and that can be an issue sometimes so maybe you have to plan a little bit different uh, your rotation to to increase it slowly Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. We've had some great questions there and a really brilliant turnout. And also a thank you, big thank you to you, Mark, for presenting tonight. Um, for those beef producers listening, we have another webinar next Tuesday on optimising fertility and health of the suckler cow post-carving. Um, that's available to register for now on the website if you are interested in that. Thank you again. Have a good evening, everybody.